This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. Meat Hunt, the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E.com. All right, everybody, joined today by David Chang. Holy smokes. Excited to be here. I, uh, you, okay, uh, David Chang, Michelin star chef, uh, Momofuku restaurant group, podcaster, tons of television, like a lot of television. Started out as a chef. Yep. We now just I t- just play one on TV. Now yeah. you just play one. <laughs> we just talked about you a whole bunch because, as I described to you earlier, I had was moose hunting and um we ate a lot of uh we ate a lot of your ramen. Oh wow. A lot of your ramen. Um with moose. maybe in an area that no one has ever eaten your ramen. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got home and got to talking about this and and uh Randall Weaver here. <laughs> he was saying that that he likes to he likes to eat your the the momofuku ramen because you don't feel like it's such a piece of shit eating it well, yeah it's not it's not, he's, it's not fried that's how, he, that's how he put it I was well like, not just I physiologically yeah. not just physiologically but in terms of self-esteem uh, and all that stuff that's a that's the what shame that's not as much marketing. shame in it no no i was like i know exactly what you mean you don't feel like it just does, yeah you feel it feels like clean and good dude I, I i'll tell you i sat down and did um I sat down and did three packs. Wow! In a sit, well, that's a, two is really sort of the proper portion. I oh, think. really? Yeah. No, yeah. we we threw my, down on a three pack. I don't, what are you good for, Randall? I don't know. I'm I'm thrilled to go home though and tell my wife that two is actually the proper amount for one person. <laughs> well, listen, we're gonna send you a whole boatload of the Momo product. Trust oh, me. Oh, the, the, okay. listen, that, that's phenomenal. Um, no, it was, it, that shit was good. And and a buddy of mine, we were sitting there after we got a moose uh my colleague seth that i work with he was he went to the over to where we were storing all the meat and he went over to one of the game bags and was cutting himself off super thin wow. moose slices skewering them on a stick and then he did the momofuku uh can you say Momofuku once? Momofuku. So I'm saying exactly but I, yeah, right. Yeah, but I've heard every pronunciation of it. Momofuku <laughs> is probably sure. the most popular way of saying it. Huh. Momo, they had to know, but it's fine. Yeah. Sounds like, reason I named it that, it sounds like motherfucker. Sure it does. Yeah. That really is? Yeah. So it doesn't mean something? It does, because uh, I thought when we did the restaurant, when it came up with the idea in 2004, was to introduce ramen, reintroduce ramen to America, because mm-hmm. most people know it as instant noodles. The guy that created it was a Taiwanese guy. He wasn't even Japanese. He created to sort of feed post-war Japan hmm. in, a, in a fast way. Is that right? And his name was Momofuku. And I thought it would be... Are you serious? Yeah. And I, at the time, I was still reading a lot of books about logic and tautologies and shit like that. Man, I was smoking a lot of pot back then. <laughs> but like, I thought that was... Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds like motherfucker. The guy's name was Momofuku, even though now legally I'm not allowed to say it, even though we've won that case. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, and three, you know, the first concert I went to, a well, second concert I went to was the Almond Brothers when I was growing up, because mm. I grew up in Virginia. And well, my, how, my, why is that? Because that wouldn't yeah, mean to I'm, me that you I'm went to the, the no, Almond no, no, Brothers. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, no, this explains something. <laughs> I mean, I've seen the Almond Brothers. My favorite but I'm not album. From no, 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 this is all going to make sense. My, because uh, there was a. Um, my favorite cover as a kid was Eat a Peach. Mm. Uh, and that's when I remember going there, I remember I, I didn't even see, I didn't even know what a vinyl record looked like. And I saw that and be like, oh, that's a cool thing. So that was always ingrained in my head. When I went to the concert and people wearing t-shirts of that same, that, that, that cover of that album. So it became something that was like, of always, I've always associated positive memories. And then I'm in Japan learning Japanese mm-hmm. cooking. And I'm learning things, words that were mostly associated with food. Momo means leg. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, if you go to a yakitori restaurant, you get momo. Um, and fuku is like an edge of lucky. So I said lucky peach. So no our shit. logo uh. became the peach. Uh. Uh. So that's why the Almond Brothers came in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Isn't that funny when you, uh, you're talking about uh, your Japanese being food things is 
I've always struggled with Spanish, um, but I can oftentimes smoke people on my uh, the the I the wildlife names. <laughs> Like I used to know like every, like I, I'd be like, I don't really know any Spanish except I can name most fish <laughs> in Spanish and a lot of game animals in Spanish. Uh, but yeah, that, no, that stuff was phenomenal, man. So he was cooking little moose slices and, and, and dressing his thing up. Um, so did he, did he boil it or did he roast it? We had a big argument. No, no, he was boy. He was just skewering his little thin super moose slices on a stick a little bit. And little strips of fat on a stick and then putting them in. I was encouraging him to get it boiling and just drop it in, which he didn't want to do it that way for whatever reason. And another debate we had. Well, you're I, the better cook because clearly <laughs> you, I think you had a better understanding. So sorry, your friend, this friend yeah, that I've never met before. Seth, yeah, Seth. He's, 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 he's on this show quite frequently. <laughs> um, he also, we had a debate. I'd like you to settle this once and for all. He felt that you shouldn't actually boil the stuff. He'd like to have it be that you would just put hot water on it and then let it give it a good soak. Contrary <laughs> to the instructions, which is a three minute boil. Seth, I appreciate the independent thinking, <laughs> the out of the box thinking. I, I'm sure sometimes that out of the box thinking can come in handy, uh, yeah. but not in this situation, no. Uh, it is not designed. In fact, I think it should be cooked. 30 seconds to a minute longer than the three minutes okay um because it is air dried it will oh. work eventually it'll just saturate and that's how it can be done but it should be boiled we're working on some other noodles where it can work that way and i'll make oh, sure to send that to seth. A quicker noodle yeah. though he doesn't look foolish because seth that he's was just, just not the way to cook that yeah he's ahead of his time <laughs> dude no that stuff yeah i really really appreciated it and um and i had i had, man what's what, what year did you start in the restaurant business 1999. Oh, okay. So you had been going quite a while before I went in, but I, I was, I ate in your restaurants early on, but not that early. Um, we're going to get into your whole life story. You're a big fly fisherman. Yes. Saltwater fly fisherman. I moved on to, I, although I did a lot of trout fishing this summer, saltwater is where I, I think about almost all the time. I feel like that was, that would surprise a lot of people who are familiar with your stuff. Yeah. A lot of people don't, <laughs> don't know that. <laughs> Uh, there's not a lot of crew people uh, on the flats in, in Mexico. Uh, we got to touch on a couple things. So, man, one of these, Randall, you got to take it over on one of these. Are you ready? I think so. Because the couple people, okay, I'll, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And you're going to have to jump in because it had some, some people I respect a lot who were riled up. Remember, I was talking about the guy, the climate change guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. No. First off, guy wrote in to say that, um, we were talking about the number of PhDs out there. And, and a guy wrote in talking about the great explosion in PhD candidates. And he views it as a mar like a market economy issue. Yeah. The colleges realize they can make money producing these things. Um, but I'm only throwing that out there because I was talking about, was it the journal Nature? Yes. Okay. On a past episode, and I've been, and I've had multiple academics write in very upset with me, including some people that I count as my friend. I mentioned a article that was in Free Press. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. A guy wrote, a, a, an a academic researcher who works on wildfires wrote an article in Free Press, and he was saying, I was just published in the journal Nature about California wildfires. I'll point out we're in California right now. Uh, he, I was just publishing the journal Nature about, about wild, wildfires. And he said, and here's what it takes. This is an op-ed. And he's like, here's what it takes to publish in esteemed journals like Nature is you have to push a climate change supremacy perspective in order to be taken seriously by journals. Meaning, uh, you know, 80% of California wildfires are human caused. If you wrote a pa published a paper about that, that's not going to grab their interest. Um, electrical transmission, like we just saw at the fires in Maui, the dangers of how we, you know, transfer electricity can lead to a lot of wildfires. That won't be of interest to nature. What nature would want to hear, what they mandate to hear is they want to hear the climate change connection. Um, and I pointed out this fact 
But then it wound up being that this guy got himself in all kind of hot water mm-hmm. and had maybe already gotten in hot water um, at the time I brought it up. And I only told a fraction of the story. And a lot of people were like, dude, you kind of like started off on the first page and ended and you didn't get to the end of the book on this. Do you yeah. care to take this up? I mean, I, I can only speak to what I read, but apparently the journal had asked him to provide they said well did you consider x y and z and he said oh no we didn't have time or we didn't have funding to look at these different factors yep um and he he you know he he responded to the reviewers by saying we looked at a b and c not x y and z which is why and and so they apparently asked him you yep. for the thing that he said they weren't interested in yeah and then they he went, had specifically asked him about the very same things he said that they didn't want to and hear then, about. Yeah, and then he kind of turned around and said they only wanted A, B, and C, and they they didn't ask me about X, Y, Z when in fact they had prior to the publication of the article. So, yeah, it wound up being like a not smart move for that dude. Yeah, I think it came back to bite him. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, so just just so so Bob, you know who you are. <laughs> Jim, you know who you are. These are actual names too. Yeah. You think so? I'm making up names. Bob and Jim. I'm not. <laughs> Bob and Jim. You know who you are. I'm not. I, I I have I've um stand corrected. Yeah, no, I mean, not corrected. Yeah, but... not corrected. But I appreciate the notes. <laughs> I appreciate the notes. I gotta keep these academic types keep them warm. Yeah, because they provide you a lot of information. Uh, on our episode 474, this is more listener feedback. This is a little thing we do, a little, little listener feedback. On our episode 474, animal diseases, someone writes this in. Steve seems shocked to find out about frogs being used for pregnancy detection. This concept was actually developed after a test, after a test that is known as the rabbit test. It's ringing a bell to you? Absolutely no idea. They used to use frogs. Check this out. <laughs> they used to use frogs. You could use frogs to tell if a woman was pregnant. That's how pregnancy tests used to be with frogs. What do you mean used to be? Accurate. Actual <laughs> frogs. Was this an accurate way? <laughs> yes. Yes, it was. You could you could take uh you could you could do, I'm not sure how it was done. There was a swab that you could do of a woman and it would like there would be like L- levels of hormonal i don't know if it's like the, the estrogen level whatever hormone levels and you could induce a you could induce a like reproductive response in a frog with this swab and that would tell you if that was a pregnant individual seems like a lot of work well <laughs> These frogs, here's the crazy part. We got in this whole podcast episode with an with animal disease specialist. These frogs develop some sort of virus. And now native frogs in this country, this virus is traveling among native frogs in this country, to which I asked, how did they even get this virus? They got this virus from these pregnancy frogs <laughs> being released into the wild. So... This co- as this r- listener goes on, this concept was actually developed after a test that's known as the rabbit test. The test, which involved subcutaneously injecting blood or urine of women assumed to be pregnant into rabbits or mice, then dispatching the rabbit to determine if there was follicular activity on the ovaries. This is the origin of the saying, and he's acting like this is going to illuminate something for me. (laughs) This is the origin of the saying, the rabbit died when referencing a woman who had been confirmed as pregnant. Not in my social Not ringing any bells. (laughs) No? I've never had that happen. Maybe we should... Did this take place? Yeah, I, I didn't do a lot of work on it. We could repopularize <laughs> that one, I think. This is a misnomer, this listener goes on to say. As regardless of the woman's pregnancy status, the rabbit had perished. Wayne. Wayne wrote that in. Thanks, Wayne. Did he uh 
Where's he from? Did he give a location? He didn't give any location. Mm-hmm. That would have been interesting. Well, I'm gonna start using that, man. Yeah, the old you know, I don't know if you died. know about my neighbor, but the old uh, <laughs> rabbit has died. <laughs> fish spills in Louisiana. This is a serious issue, and, and you as a, as a, as a fishing angler will be curious. Uh, it would be good to know. I don't want to give the guy's full name. A guy wrote in. He's from Louisiana. He's in the Navy. He's currently stationed in San Diego. Um, however, he's originally from South Louisiana, where he points out. There is a, quote, massive problem with pogey boats. Menhaden. This Menhaden. is the, the fish of many names. Menhaden. Mm-hmm. They call them pogies in the Gulf. They call them Menhaden in Chesapeake Bay. They Bunker. got a handful of other names. Bunkers, another one. Bunkers, another one. Oh, so, so if you're sitting there at home and you're like, never heard of a pogey, but I know a bunker. Same guy, same fish. Massive problem with pogey boats fishing too close to the coastline and wiping out our populations of game fish. He goes on to talk about, um, oh, he, he sends along. The forwarded email below is what the state president sent out from a, uh, from a, 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 a fishing conservation organization. And it gets into this, uh, it gets into this pogey boat habit where they are dumping. I'm trying to find the link here. dumping enormous numbers of dead fish. And I hadn't realized this when these, when these pogey boats are operating and part of the problem here is, so I'm on the board, like, I'm on the board of an organization called Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership and TRCP where Randall's worked. Um, they've focused a lot of energy on the Menhaden, the unregulated Menhaden harvest in Chesapeake Bay. And I think they're now involved. Yeah, they've, they've also focused on, the fishery in the Gulf, but the Chesapeake Bay one has been a really hot issue. When they're doing these, when, when they're doing this pogey netting, apparently during the process of netting, the fish die. So when they're hauling them up, the fish are dead and they'll now and then have these breaches and they need to report how many fish are killed when there's a breach or a spill. And it is just a litany of insane numbers of, of millions of fish dumped. And I couldn't believe when I got to reading about this. I mean, I knew about the, the lack of regulation on this fishery. It's like often international interests operating without regulation, killing a forage fish that drives the whole ocean ecosystem so that it can be like ground up for fish oil and pet food. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like, t- like knocking the legs off the stool on marine resources. One of the reasons they have to report a lot of these fish spills, this blew my mind, is because they caught too many. And sometimes the nets get, th- their nets will get so full of pogies and redfish and all kinds of other game fish that they don't have the machinery to hoist it. By the time they find this out, it's all dead anyway. And so they'll need to abandon what's called abandon the catch and then file a report. But they're, they're, some of these outfits are in trouble now for not filing the reports. And then file a report and saying, hey, what we were doing worked better than we thought. Heads up, we just dumped 800,000 dead pogies and redfish on the beach. It just blows my mind that this is a that that this goes on yeah this if you ever see photos of these big catches and like a commercial menhaden harvest the scale of it is unbelievable and it's one of those things too where it's like a lot I mean, of t- i'm so worked up i'm gonna put my glasses a on, lot right? of times when you talk about allocation and like people using a resource in different ways there's like some nuance and some gray area but i think this is like one case in which there's most folks agree that there's a bad actor here and it's these boats that have this enormous footprint. Isn't this happening to most fish caught in nets, right? They have a, a charter and a license to catch, say, cod, but they catch all kinds bycatch. of other species, and they can't do anything with it because they're not allowed to, so they just chuck it back in the water dead. Uh, yeah, it, it's common, and there are a lot of, like, like you know, like salmon per sanding in Alaska. It's a very responsible fishery, but some of this stuff is egregious. So this is all the stuff this guy's re- referring to point in the news. So here, here's an article. Um, 
here's an article about the Louisiana spills. Three massive fish spills that coated waves and beaches off the southwest coast of Louisiana last week has renewed calls for tidal restrictions on the Manhattan industry. Manhattan, how do you say it? Manhattan. Manhattan. Two Manhattan fishing companies dumped an estimated 850,000, that's more than I'd catch in a full weekend of fishing, (laughs) an estimated 850,000 fish in the waters off Cameron Parish during three incidents over four days. The fish form rotting rafts that either floated in the deeper water or washed up by the thousands near Holly Beach, one of the few communities in the sparsely populated parish. Amid the dead, amid the dead, Menhaden, also called Pogi, were hundreds of redfish. And then it gets into contributing to sharp redfish population declines, that the industry is contributing to these redfish declines. And there's photos of just beaches littered with the stuff. These companies are now required, they're supposed to go around and clean up all their dead fish. The first of the three incidents happened on September 11 when the net of a vessel fishing for Omega ripped and spilled an estimated 200,000 dead fish about two miles east of Cameron Bar. The other two incidents happened on September 14th. Another vessel released 350,000 fish after its net broke. Around the same time, a West Bank vessel caught, quote, an unmanageable load. Rather than lose the whole catch in the net, the captain decided to let part of the catch go. They dumped between 100,000 and 300,000 dead fish on the beach. Follows up from the summer before when they dumped a million dead Manhattan near Holly Beach, Manhattan near Holly Beach. Mind-boggling numbers. It really is. I just looked at the photo. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That is insane. (laughs) It's really something. All right. That's all. (laughs) Now I know. (laughs) (laughs) On that happy note. So uh, tell me, uh, what what was your... You you described that you grew up um, in, in what you call the preppy neighborhood. No, I, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Alexandria, uh-huh. outside D.C., but my father had a business and I had relatives that lived in Richmond, and I could not understand that why Richmond was so goddamn different than <laughs> where I grew up, because it's, I always say that when you get to Richmond or uh, Winchester, so two hours mm-hmm. south or two hours west of Northern Virginia or D.C. area, that's like, to me, where the South actually begins. Okay. Yeah then everything else is the mid-Atlantic. It's basically the North. So I lived in Northern Virginia. Um, but all I did playing, all I did was play golf when I was a kid. Yeah, was your, your old man was in the golf business? Yeah, it's crazy. Do so you still I golf now? I picked it up again during the pandemic after maybe 30 years of not playing. How old are you? Turned 46. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so you didn't play for 30, oh. No, I'm like, yeah. I, I got to do the math real quick. So I was, you quit young. <laughs> 14 years old was when I stopped playing competitively, but I played many tournaments, yeah. mostly, you know, in the South. Yeah. You were, uh, you were a child competitive golfer. Yeah. Most of, I always Did say. you get pretty good at I mean, that's been pretty good at Yeah, I won the Virginia State Championship a couple years. Wow. Uh, when I always say my old man was the, now if you go to a, a golf tournament or any golf course, you're going to see a really a Korean dad yelling at his kid. I always say my dad was the first. <laughs> he, he pioneered that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause he wanted you to be, he wanted you to be like good. Yeah. He wanted me to be a pro golfer. So, um, you know, I had three brothers and older sister, but, uh, I, I, you know, supposedly I had the most talent amongst everybody. So he really pushed me. What was his, what was his, how was he in the golf business? He's a supply, like a distributor. Yeah, he got, so we came to America in 1963 which is funny because most people, they had the, the they repeal the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Immigration Act. So all of a sudden you had a lot of Koreans coming in that were mostly academics, right? And uh, engineers. My dad was not any of those. My dad just hustled and, and he came here and didn't speak any English. And he got in, that's a whole nother story how he got a visa. But he came here in 1963, not an academic, and he worked in restaurants. And where did he come from? What part of Korea? 
born in North Korea. Okay, that's what I'm curious Korea. about. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, so my mother as well, um, or she lived in Kesung. So my mom's side came from extraordinary wealth. Uh, my dad came from real hardcore Christians, mm-hmm. like from nothing really. Um, mm-hmm. So polar opposites. Um, and when you say North Korea now, people are like, oh, that's, but, but they don't understand. That was like Vermont. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now it's not. So yeah, you hear North Korea now, and you just think of Dennis Rodman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he he came here with nothing, and and uh, um, he, you know, he just worked in restaurants for like twenty five years. He worked his entire life uh, in restaurants for the most part in America, and then somehow got into the golf business, hmm. and uh, that's how it all happened. Yeah. What was, when you were raised, what was, uh, what was your awareness of outdoor, you know, not when I say outdoor, I mean, you, of course you play golf outdoors, but somehow it's unoutdoorsy in my view. Uh, what, what was your awareness of fishing and we would go crabbing, we would oh, go would, fishing okay. a lot in mm-hmm. the Chesapeake. Um, I never went freshwater fishing in terms of hunting. My dad had a golf store and all of his sales reps were, um, yeah, they were, they just. They would take videos of bow hunting, and I would watch that all the time. Seriously, yeah. really? They would. So they would. Um, I remember this guy, JC, uh, Todd, like all these guys. They were all hunters. Yeah. Um, Eddie was the repair guy. He also hunted. Um, <laughs> that was so long ago. And uh, I remember when the handheld camcorder became a thing, and they would like, you know, record these things. And in that area, especially back then, now it's no. Super these are developed. like Korean dudes or no. not Korean? Oh, not Korean dudes. These so are, your, your dad, these are like, your dad yeah. didn't. He wasn't like uh, your dad didn't just hang out with Korean dudes because he was from Korea. Oh, he hung out with Korean. My dad hung out with Korean dudes and everybody, but the sales yeah. people were totally different, right? Got it, mm-hmm. got it. Um, and I remember that they really loved. They like working there specifically because a lot of the people that would shop at the store lived on really large plots of land. <laughs> so they were able not only to—that's a good, that's a good hustle. Yeah, yeah, it's a side hustle. I'm feeling the sad guy. So, so they would uh, not, you know, if you're a good salesperson, you get to know everybody, especially yeah. repeat customers, right? Yeah. And at the time, and this is how it all happened. Tyson's Corner was literally farmland. When I moved from my original house where I was born, we literally lived on like a farm. There's nothing near mm-hmm. us. And now Tyson's Corner is this like the just suburban commercial. retail sprawl. Yeah. It's really gross and you would never know that it was farmland. Um, and back then it started to get very, very wealthy too, because it was the premier shopping center outside, you know, Washington DC. So McLean, Potomac, really these suburbs that became very, very wealthy and huge plots of land. So these people would also, they're not hunters, they play golf, but they'd always complain about deers eating something or whatever. So this is really what happened. I think one of these guys must have got convinced a bunch of other people to learn how to sell, sell golf, golf gear, and you're going to get permission to hunt on land. <laughs> Dude, this is going to, I used to have a list of like the most, like the most hunting friendliest occupations. And, uh, I recently met a guy who does ag loans. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's like, listen, you want to talk about permissions. So a guy that does agricultural loans. Working for the USDA ARS because the vacation policy is just absolutely insane. Um, firefighters that work four on, four off. That's pretty good. But I'm going to add a uh, golf sales rep. Golf. Yeah. And, <laughs> golf. and you probably look really respectable. You've got yeah, they're your always golf. in khakis yeah, and right. a polo shirt. <laughs> and like, but these guys would just always, when it was the like, hunting season on, they would always just go bow hunting and they would almost sell their services as like, we can exterminate all the right, deer from right. the land. I remember being as a kid, all this happening. I was like, and I always ask my parents, like, you are not hanging what out was with your, those guys. <laughs> yeah, what, what was your what was your reaction to it at the time? Like, how did you? I remember seeing this guy JC. I mean, I remember seeing a video. I'd be like, it was so early on. I don't even know how he did it, <laughs> but he's like, Dave, check that, check this out, and. I mean, I, I, that was the first time I saw a deer shot with yeah. Bo was on, on his home video, on his home video. I would remember mm-hmm. I was sitting on a tripod golf folding chair mm-hmm. behind the cash register. And <laughs> I remember exactly <laughs> when it happened actually. 
uh, yeah. <laughs> so when you're when you're uh, if your old man wanted you to get into, he wanted you to be a professional golfer. Meaning, I read that as he wanted you to live out. Yeah. His I, fantasy. Man, I have no idea how the hell he came up with that fantasy. It was proxy. It was like a proxy so dream. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. When when you when you uh, got into restaurant work. Was his initial thing like, oh, brother? He thought it was, um, what do you call it? A hobby. <laughs> He's such a dick. <laughs> he was like, he's just a hobby. But, you know, I tried to drop out of college to go there. And I didn't know if I, I remember going abroad and trying to go into cooking school there, but I didn't know anything. There was no internet. There was no way when to When you find say there, what do you mean there? In the UK, one okay. of the great chefs of Got all it. time, Pierre, Marco Pierre White, was literally running a restaurant called Harvey's, maybe like, 10 minutes away from where I lived. I didn't know. Hmm. But, you know, today if with the internet, I probably would have like, oh, I'm going to try to get a job there. I yeah. had no idea. So I tried to apply. I didn't get in. That was my first attempt to like enter the coloring profession. Um, so you you wanted to enter like that. You don't no, want to enter as no, some no, no, dude no. working at McDonald's. I never got a chance to work because I only played golf. The only thing I ever did was play golf. For like 14 years of my life. I played competitively from age five to 14. I got recruited to play golf at all the top high school prep schools. Um, and I chose to go so to one. good, man. I was pretty good, yeah. yeah. And I burned out. I burned out. I had a meltdown of epic proportions. I was trying to qualify for the U.S. Amateur. Not the U.S. Junior Amateur. The U.S. Amateur sectional qualifying was at Robert Trent Jones in uh, Manassas, Virginia. And uh, I, on the second 18, I had a total meltdown, and I never recovered. I was a huge basket case. When you say a meltdown, you mean like the meltdown, the dude in uh, Royal Tenant yeah, Bombs? Yeah, I actually used that as an example exactly. in a journalist meltdown. years ago. I was like, when I saw that, I was like, that was, that was, that was me. <laughs> like, a, like you had a meltdown, meaning not sort of a prolonged, I mean, you had a meltdown meltdown. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, all Be of a sudden. Because, again, this is, it gets in the nerdiness of golf. Robert Trent Jones is one of the longest courses in the world, particularly from hole to hole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just, people don't walk it. They play it in a golf cart. My caddy didn't show up. It was my friend, Jason Dollard. I remember that. <laughs> didn't show up. <laughs> and I played like really well the first 18. And it was also like a sweltering Virginia hop. It was like 100 plus, 100% humidity. It's just not nice weather to play golf in. And I remember being like, if I played well in the second 18, I had a shot of maybe making the next qualifying round. And I felt bad. This guy, Chad Mosley, holy shit. He was my second 18. I haven't thought about- You got all the names. I haven't thought about this in years. Yeah. I feel like Rain Man right now. Um, <laughs> I think talking yeah, about- like all, a therapy session yeah. where you're like, you're coming to repress memories. Man. I think talking about all the, the sales reps triggered something in my head because I didn't remember <laughs> these fucking names in years. Anyway, this guy who wound up playing golf at UVA, very good golfer. Yeah. He never, he was always so mad at me because I should have uh, DQ'd myself. But I kept on playing, and I think I was like crying. I don't know what happened, but I just had a mental breakdown playing golf, and I just never recovered from that's playing a young competitive kid, golf. Though, man, like, but th and that's all I did. I didn't have a normal yeah. childhood. No, no, I'm not criticizing you for having a mental breakdown. I mean, it's just putting, it's just you're thrusting yourself into a, or your your family. I mean, that's just intense, you know. Uh, our little, my little boy plays soccer and, and they, there was reason I didn't read it, but I heard about it. There was recently an email. Oh, the quiet Saturday. Asking something. people to chill. Parents. <laughs> Not like a lot of loud cheering. I mean, this is you know, like, years like, ago. I can't different picture, time. like, it's hard to picture driving a, you know, like driving a kid to that, to, to like I mean, it happens a lot. issue, man. It happens a lot in golf. In tennis, yeah, you hear about I feel like those too. individual sports. Yeah. Especially where you have to begin at such Especially a young Especially immigrant age. parents, too. It's like push, 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 you know? Man, we've had a whole series of immigrant parents, or children of immigrant parents. We, we, we just had a guy on who came from Vietnam, Sun Tao, who became a, a, he's a competitive fly tire, like a master fly tire. He came from, his parents came from South Vietnam after the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. Then we had uh, Meng Shefan, who was another Cold, like a Cold War refugee, from, Meng dude who was a Cold War refugee from Laos who became an American chef. Um, and they both talked a lot about immigrant parents where Sun Tao said, um, 
there's three ways this can go. You're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're not my kid. <laughs> it's pretty much, pretty much the same saying. Yeah, I can totally relate. So me choosing to um, become a cook wasn't just for my parents. It was a point in my life where I was like, I hate everything. I'm doing something that is effectively back then because cooking is cool now. Mm -hmm. It was like social suicide to some degree, right? Like, is that right? In my world, I went to prep school. I went all this thing. Nobody I knew would even think about becoming a cook. That was ridiculous. That's exactly why. I well, what if you use the word like chef. subversive? To oh you. yeah, it was total rebellion. Yeah. And then I found out when I started cooking, I, I'm a hyper competitive person. I wound up playing other sports. Um, I never really played team sports until I got to high school, and I loved it. There was something about working in a kitchen. And, and I there's a, listen, anytime you walk in a kitchen of any sort, if it's fast food or not, it's hard. But when you walk into a place that's trying to be one of the very best in your town, in the world, it's a different ballgame. And there was a level of seriousness and competitiveness and desire to constantly improve that resonated with me. Mm. Simultaneously, all of these professionals that I was looking at as like demigods almost, everyone was dead serious, but also the funniest motherfucker I've ever come across mm. and probably couldn't do their laundry properly because they didn't know how to do it. Their life outside of the kitchen was in total shambles, but you put them in whites, put them ready for service. They were like F1 race car drivers, you know? Mm. And I love that dichotomy. And I love that it was everyone came from all sorts of upbringings, backgrounds, parts of the world. It was uh, coming from like this homogenized background that I sort of grew up in. This was the polar opposite and I loved it, you know? Getting to work with people that didn't speak English, you know? People that just immigrated from Mexico or what I did see with working with a lot of the prep teams and the dishwashers, they always reminded me of my dad. Mm -hmm. yeah. That hard work mentality. It was like, this is the only job they can do. So that hopefully they do it so well that their kids don't have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that perspective I think is, is something that is lost on a lot of people. Um, I think like I saw it in my own, my own dad, you know, he never finished high school. Right. But there's this, like, but I just don't know if, that idea that I'm struggling for words here because it's, it's hard thing to, to phrase up, but that idea that I'm, I'm like sucking hind titty right now so that you don't have to. Yeah. As I think that, that families or however you track families and lineages at some point in time, you get out of that. Right. And then, and then it's like the I I, I worry that it, that you create like a decline like a decline of the empire because like right now for me to in any way ever act like I'm sucking hind titty so that my kid don't have to I mean I have the you know my, as my wife says man you better be careful who you complain to right <laughs> it, 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 it's so like to to see and then my kid's not gonna like I can run around and look at sacrifices you know. I'll run around, look at sacrifices. Like my, my dad was raised by Im Italian immigrants, fought in the war, right? Grew up super, super poor. Um, and that created like a, like a drive, right? Absolutely. And then, and then you wonder like, what happens next? <laughs> like, do they, <laughs> they, they, they cause then, then every, everything is, is opulence and decay, man. I guess that's a hard part of. So I hope my kids aren't listening. <laughs> how, how, how do you, as a parent, then institute some kind of struggle that's not like crazy? You know, oh, what I mean? we do it through just chores and and discipline and long hikes and shitty experiences <laughs> and whatever. whatever we can, it's manufactured. Right. In some way, it's manufactured. I found some of us recently. Like, I'll take my kids to do stuff. They're like, "Why do I have to do this?" You know, and I sometimes say to them, "It's just so you can hang out with cool people when you get older. <laughs> <laughs> They'll appreciate it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the truth, man. <laughs> They'll appreciate your tenacity." <laughs> yeah, man, that's tough. but it's like it's it, you, it's man. You have to manufacture it. It's not. It, it's not like that. It's it's you somehow move beyond 
yeah, you, I, you worry about what happens when, when you've moved beyond the struggle. I mean, you know, you got to be careful who you bring up the Unabomber around, but that was one of the Unabomber's big gripes was that everybody had it so damn easy now. And it gave us all this room for all of our neurotic behavior. Not that he wasn't a little bit neurotic. <laughs> there could have been other ways he could have communicated that. <laughs> Many other ways. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, inherited success, inherited success is very difficult. You know, it's just as difficult as a, I would imagine inherited wealth, right? Oh, like, dude, it's a curse, yeah. It's like, just get me worried now. Um, okay, I want to keep going. <laughs> I don't want to hang up on that one. Earlier you were telling me you... Uh, in your training as a chef, you wound up in Japan. Yeah. And you were telling me how you wound up, uh, somehow they had it pegged that you were interested in prepping turtles. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is like after some I, kind of weird misunderstanding. <laughs> I've, I've, I've worked in Japan a bunch. You know, first time I was not cooking, I was teaching English. Then I come back and long story cut short, second time around, I'm working in Japan cooking. And then I open up a restaurant and I come back and they invite me because now I'm, you know, a person of note or successful. And they invited a bunch of chefs, um, no, three or four of us to come down. And we're in Kyoto, right? Where there's restaurants that are 400 years old. Isn't that wild? Older really? than America. That's wild. Right. There is a restaurant that's almost a thousand years old. There. You're kidding. No. <laughs> I remember being in a bar in, uh, I remember being in a bar in Oxford and someone pointing out this bar has been in business longer than your country has existed. <laughs> It's amazing, right? I like. I, I, I never thought. I, it makes total sense, but I just never thought of that. You know, I don't know. I just never that thought food, of Japan. Their having food that. hasn't changed yeah. in like a millennia. Crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. Especially the food in Kyoto. Wow. Um, Is it good? It's 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 not just good. It's a. Uh, it's like going to the Library of Alexandria almost for food, right? Is that they're, right? They're <laughs> like maintaining traditions that go back hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, it had nothing to do with the kitchen, but one of the farms there that a lot of the places use, I was eating strawberries and it was like dead winter and it didn't look fancy. In fact, it looked sort of dilapidated, but you eat these strawberries and I was eating strawberries and I was like, that's like the best strawberry I've ever had in my life. Like, and then he's like, oh, the farmer's like, oh, eat this one over here under this other pile of stuff. To tasted totally different. And he's telling me why it tastes different. I'm like, I have no idea because of the translator. And I'm like, why does it taste good? And then the translator goes, oh, because he's like the 14th generation farmer. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. Right? When you start thinking yeah. about it that way, it's like, oh, this person knows so much more about growing fruits than anybody else. Yeah. Particularly in that area. Probably not as good if you moved, you know, a couple towns over. But in that terroir, nobody's going to grow stuff better than this guy. Okay. And yeah. when you understand that. God, that longevity is incredible. Crazy. Like, yeah, you, know, you most Amer you know you go to most Americans, man. They can't. You get back four generations. They're like a little hazy on what country they might have come from. You know? Oh yeah, it's I like don't even have to gone, go that far. Dude. It's 14 gone. Fourteen generations. Think yeah, about that. It's That's gone. wild. So, I think when I got there, again, I was. I think about all that I learned there and what I saw. But one of the things I got somehow communicated was, oh, Chef Chang, he wants to learn how to, you know, cook supon, which is Japanese soft shell turtles. And I was like, cool, I, I want to learn it one day. And then the day after, the day after, I was like, there must be some misunderstanding here, man. I'm never going to cook this when I get back to America. Yeah. I've never cooked it since. How, uh, walk me through, like, what is the, what is their, what is the preparation? So you take these things, they're like yellow or white, um, and they have like sort of a soft shell. And then they're cooked. I mean, how many pounds is one of these things? I mean, probably like four pounds. Okay. They're tiny. Mm, yeah. They can be bigger, but I don't think about the tiny ones. I don't even know if they're farm raised. Not. No, they're they're wild and then their uh their diet is cleaned. So yep. it's like mm -hmm. and then <laughs> you take the thing and there's like not like almost like a thin skewer, not pointed, and you sort of agitate the hell out of the head until it bites it. Yep. And then you grab it with your left hand and it's like this. And it's again, you're like pretty traumatic because it's very phallic seeming and then you basically yank the head as far as you can go and you take a you know short deba like a japanese butcher knife and you <laughs> you slice it right in front of your groin area <laughs> and it was very weird oh i got it. yeah it's yeah. like doing a like a circle it's like a yeah a bad dream to yourself <laughs> almost right and i was like this is not i don't first of all that was a lot to process just killing the turtle 
And then um, you cut around it, pop off the shell. And I don't remember, we're talking about the organs. I just remember it all feeling like it was moving, like it was an alien. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's very watery inside yeah. there. Yeah. And anatomy that I just, I don't even know what was what. You know, everything looked like an intestine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know what the hell is happening in there. And uh, you don't need any of that, or, you know. Um, so you basically scoop all that out. But what they really wanted was the meat under the shell. Like there's like a lining of that. Yep. And the feet, hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and the neck. But mainly what you do is you would blanch it and then you'd peel the skin off and then you would make it into a, a broth. So any part of meat attached to it you would again chop it up and it's in kyoto of delicacy of this beautiful clean broth uh soup uh, with like turtle feet basically <laughs> uh -huh. cooked down though yeah and, and it's gelat it was it's delicious and i know somebody listening that's probably again i had no idea that in michigan people ate turtles i i just didn't think anybody ate turtles yeah. i had no idea um i assure you it's it's really wonderful and it's delicious so that's that was my I must have done like 50 of those that week. <laughs> you had your fill of it. Yeah. 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 I was like, oh. So th that, uh, when you told me that earlier, I, I thought that was like when you're in your younger years. No, that happened when I was like 30. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Uh, how did it, what did that path look like for you to, you know, you came out of being a golfer, um, decided you're going to go down and, and be a cook and a chef. At what point did it, did it, did you get where you're going to take the leap and, uh, you know, try to open your own place? So I think it's important to note, like <laughs> go back to college. So I, I, I went to Trinity college in Hartford. Uh, I had a great time. I, 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 I had a wonderful time. I partied my ass off and, uh, I did terribly in school. What you, what were you supposed to be studying? anything to get me into law school or investment banking or anything mm. but that <laughs> the liberal arts school there's like 1500 kids nescac new england and what i wound up doing, so you you were being groomed to be a banker uh, something like that right but yeah. um or something in the corporate world yeah um and all my friends are doing those things for the most part from college i wound up the classes I wound up doing really well and mainly because I took these classes because they were like, you know, three, three in the afternoon, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like things like that were religion and philosophy. Um, and I came from a very hardcore Presbyterian family. Um, a lot of it was from, you know, my dad's side of the family. Um, and that's where Christianity started in Korea was really North Korea of all places. Huh. So my dad's side, they were like the first Christians in Korea, like hardcore that was just how I grew up. So I was pretty rebellious to that idea as well. So I wanted to study why people were religious. And I studied a lot of things about philosophy and things that were meaningful to me, but really makes you gainfully unemployable mm -hmm. <laughs> when you graduate. <laughs> so I, 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 there was nothing I could do. And besides, those were good grades, but my other grades and other classes were terrible. So like, I couldn't really get jobs that I wanted. I, I, um, uh, so I moved to Jackson, Wyoming in the summer of 99. That's where I uh, worked at Jackson Oil Resort Lodging. And I, that's where I learned how to fly fish. So huh. I worked the oh, graveyard shift. Yeah. Huh. And I just was like, I'm just going to learn how to fly fish. So that's what I did. During the daytimes, I would just drive to McCoy Creek by myself. And I would just figure out how to do that. And that's when I caught that bug. And moved back. And then I moved to Wakayama to teach English. And I only, the, this is just give you an example of my personality. Everyone's asking me what I was going to do after graduating. I had no fucking idea. So I went to the career fair and I took the first job they offered right on the right side of the hall, like the, I can't remember the cafeteria where they're setting up all the job fair stuff and it was teaching English. And I didn't want to teach English, but that's just what I did because I could tell someone, I at least I have something to do. Yeah, you're like, hey, I know English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that was short lived, but that was an important moment because when I lived in this really so like hot it, it was almost like the jacksonville florida of japan right industrial super humid tropical climate not much to do um but there was only one place that only one there was two restaurants in my small town um and one was this ramen shop and i was like oh 
I tasted a great ramen. ramen. Job. I tasted great ramen for the first time. Like real, real delicious ramen. And I and never had anything like that. I've eaten a lot of noodles like, in my life. Is ra- I didn't know. Like I didn't know that ra- is ramen definitionally Japanese. It ramen translates to lomian from Chinese. Huh. Okay. That, yeah. So the that, noodles. That, that's what I always. Yeah. But it, it, the origins, like most things in Asia, are from China. Okay. And it's turned into a variety of things, and it's uniquely Japanese now. Got it. But, um, it, but it found its origin, and it, it. Yeah. I don't even. I, you know, the the dried blocks. That's Momofuku Ando, the guy that created instant noodles. Okay, so that that the way most Americans is just in their you know, coming of age encounter ramen as you know like a plastic wrapped dry yeah. block. That's not ramen. Yeah, but that, but that, I mean, that's what people know. And when, when you it, do it, that, it, you it have the association of it being like a Chinese food. Yeah, right? it's like, you know, how most Americans probably think Taco Bell is like Mexican food. It's, yeah, it's exactly. not, right? Yeah. So, you know, that's what I always say to anybody that's younger is like, you can't connect the dots till after the fact. You just got to keep on like chugging along. And in the moment when you're doing something, you think you're a complete failure and everything you're doing sucks. I had no idea that that moment in that crappy town in Southern Japan, eating ramen would come back to be a massive moment for me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I come back, I try to get a desk job. I do terribly. I hate it. It's now, uh, 2000, no, right before 2000. I just, I had a lot of things happen. I couple, I three friends die in a year. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in my family, uh, health, all kinds of, terrible shit and i was just like i don't want to do this anymore i don't know what i want to do were you a good cook no so even personally not for your friends my mom not never for your taught family. me how to cook at all she's okay. a great cook hmm. my mom to her day she died and refused to give me a recipe i always i was not and still to this day i say i'm not a good cook and was, oh dang chang you suck at cooking i think i'm not a good cook i'm a really good cook but it's not something that comes naturally to me no nope. mm-hmm. um so i just I got really drunk at the Christmas party. I told all my bosses how much I hated them. And uh, I literally pulled office office space. You know, that move where, you know, I'm just going to quit. And and, they, and I wanted to burn every bridge possible so I could never go back to what was a possible corporate job. And I didn't know if cooking was going to be the thing. But one of the things I learned in school was this idea of via negativa, which is early Christian theology. This is going to be crazy. It's, it's no, lay it on me, man. I'm ready for it. <laughs> Early Christian theologians would meditate on how to know God, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But God is ineffable. God is impossible to know. So they would think about what God was not. God (laughs) is not that cup of tea. God is not that table. And you would just go on and on and on. And the more you would think about what God is not, you would get closer to God, right? Yep. In some weird way. good place to start. (laughs) I was like, well, I don't know what the hell I want to do. So I'm just going to try a bunch of things. And the more I try, it'll get me close uh. to what I want to do. I just got to keep on moving along. And I'd done a bunch of jobs in my life. And I was like, you know what? I've always wanted to cook. Had a few false starts. My dad really tried hard to make sure I never worked in the culinary profession. I won't bore you with some of the stories, but he did go out of his way to make sure. Like my first job, I tried to get a cooking job. He, he like secretly sabotaged it, you know? Um, mm mm-hmm. And now I understand if my kids wanted to come and cook, I'd probably do the same thing. It's too goddamn hard. Anyway, I get into cooking. I go cooking school and I start working uh, full time immediately. And I'm pretty allergic to work at the time. Next thing you know, I'm working like I didn't take a day off for like a year. I was so immersed in it. And I realized doing what kind of food? It's like the technical. Uh, I was working for Jean George at the Mercy Kitchen. Um, and I was going to cooking school from eight o'clock to f- three o'clock. And I was working from four o'clock to one o'clock, uh, working for John George, which is sort of like uh, modified contemporary French food. John mm-hmm. George being one of the great chefs from Alsace. And he's been a mentor and a, a great, great culinary figure. And on the weekends, I started working at Kraft for Tom Colicchio, just answering phones because I know, yeah, I know. I, I wanted to work these- there because of the crew that was assembled there. I won't bore people about New York genealogy of kitchens. And the only way I could get into that kitchen was answering phones. And they didn't need me. They didn't, in fact, they did not want me. So I just answered phones on the weekends. 
So I like literally for, worked every for day. like front of house yeah. phone answering. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. I worked every day for like a year till I could like get my feet in the door there. And uh, seriously, yeah. I mean, I fucking grind, man. <laughs> like, if you need to, I fucking grind, you know? And and uh, and I was allergic to work, so I was like, holy shit, like, I'm working my ass off, and I don't know if I love it, but, like, I can't imagine doing anything else. So for me, I don't, I think it's bullshit when people say, oh, I love what I do, I love it. It's like 100%, I think that's a fucking crock of shit. It's like 51%, you love it more than you hate it. Yeah, You know? Yeah. Nobody wants to get up at, like, four in the morning to peel potatoes, but you know, you do it because it gets you just another goal. So I did that and I just was like a sponge and it wasn't, there are cooks that are much more naturally gifted. What I love about cooking, which is what I tell anybody that's worked for me or anyone that's thinking about doing it. Um, if you, if you pour yourself into this hard work is the greatest equalizer in cooking. Mm. If somebody's better than you, if you practice and if you put yourself like fully into that situation you will not only get even with that person that you view as i view everything as a competitor because i am just that kind of person because of golf everything's a fucking competition you will not only even up with that person or peer you will then exceed that person on hard work alone you know we had a we, we talked to a chef recently and he his his ticket to success early on was that he would um he would show up <laughs> what she so said crazy. it really differentiated him from his <laughs> it's true but at the time too he's like that was my secret in the morning <laughs> i would just be there that's and everything true. else just followed 100 percent the truth showing up in a job that's so fucking physically tough yeah nobody wants to do that work yeah so i i i felt lucky because there are a lot of people that were so talented and have done amazing things and i just i feel that was um instrumental moment for me and and um you know the thing is i i i didn't know nobody thought i was going to be good all right if you if you had to put like odds on anybody in that that kitchen i'm not even i'm not even i'm part of the rest of the field odds you know what i mean no <laughs> well, who's I gonna be successful <laughs> right so they'd be like 15 people on odds of who's going to be very successful. Oh, uh, yeah. I would be not even making an individual the, you're lot. You're in the everybody the else the category. category. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I understood that. And for that entire time, though, I was just trying to find things that I like to do. And I like I did eat a lot of noodles, whether it was ramen or not, because of where I grew up in Northern Virginia. There's amazing Vietnamese population, Korean food, Chinese food. So I ate a lot of delicious things and but you were drawn to the contemporary american and french shit oh yeah that? i wanted to be. was that because that's mm. where you thought success would sit yeah. or it's got you what you like to eat because that's where the best were yeah yeah, hmm. yeah that's where the best were the cell at that time the really celebrated <laughs> players were from that world and there was another chef called Al, and his name is alex lee and he was this six he's a big chinese guy and chinese american and he ran danielle's kitchen in upper east side and he was a badass right intimidating as fuck spoke the worst fluent french possible in a long island accent <laughs> but all these french chefs and sous chefs like served him i was like to a lot of asian kids growing up like he was the fucking real superstar right so i was like all, all these places you're naming man at some point i've been to like uh i've been to these i kind of forgot about yeah them. But, like i remember like daniels and <laughs> Like someone hovering like all the time, someone like changing your forks and shit out. Yeah, but I didn't want to eat that food at the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's the most, it was sort of the most like overbearing yeah. sort of shuffling of plates and shit and like what fork and it's like, <laughs> my goodness, would you people disconnect just go the, away for a minute. The people eating there and the food you're making and the people making it very different. But the reason why people are making that food and drawing that talent, because you're working with the best ingredients, yeah. the best techniques. And back then, to learn how to make any dish, like one dish, you had to like work a year there. You couldn't go online and learn anything. Yeah, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> you actually had to like spend time and maybe the chef would finally teach you how to make something. You know, that's the way it was. Um, but yeah, man, to do a thing for future generations to understand is there should be like a, you know, like a library of Congress project where you try to, so future generations can understand how shit went before the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Totally. 
I think about that a lot. Like, because people are going to lose track of if you wanted to know something, it was hard. You it was hard to find. You didn't know it at the time because everybody thinks that what they exist, their existence is totally normal. But um, if you wanted, I remember like talking about a cooking thing, trying to figure out like how mountain men would cook beaver tails. Dude, it'd take you four years to figure that shit out. <laughs> now it's like my kid can figure it out. Watch some YouTube video. Watch one of your videos. Well, yeah, yeah, just everything. It's just like it's just that's so many years of knowledge that was hard earned is now in this five minute edited video. Yeah, it's an amazing a, thing. The comedian, oh, what the hell is his name? Joey Diaz, talking about he's trying to describe dating. You know, before the internet, he's talking about how you used to have to go up and throw rocks at their window to try to wake them up. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, to learn how to make shit, like you couldn't, it was. It sounds wild, but yeah, you would have to work at a restaurant to learn how to do one thing. Yeah, if your mom, your mom had like six cookbooks and if someone made some shit in your house, it was because it was one of those six cookbooks. I mean, think about even on the cookbook level, right? Like uh, at the time, a lot of the progressive stuff was happening in France. And I won't bore your audience with like, food nerdery on the chefs but i would have friends working at some of the top places you would want to be at they would send postcards right about like hey i'm learning this but there's not enough to fucking fit on a postcard about like <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is happening you know so so i do think we we're talking about inherited success or wealth or knowledge yeah. i think that that generation everything that preceded in the internet there's a level of creativity that is better in that generation i'm not saying cooks today are Fucking more knowledge or they know more. And I'm not trying to, I can imagine all these people, oh, fuck you, Dave, you're telling, we're just as good. You are. <laughs> but the originality and creativity of the older generation from, you know, pre-internet is because we had to struggle what the fuck was happening. We yeah. Think about it. Use our imagination. We'd go to restaurants after service and just look at their menu and be like, how do you think they're making that? Mm -hmm. What do you think that sauce is? Oh, I've never heard about that. And we'd then go to Chinatown, drink some beers, eat some food, and talk about, how do you think that dish is being made? It was awesome. Yeah. But now, that camaraderie and talking about it and imagining, it's not on a YouTube video. While that's amazing, that difficulty of acquiring that information is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Another one, just to drive that point home, is I remember uh, long ago before the internet was like populated the way it is, really struggling with when you'd see the glazed roasted ducks, the Chinese style, oh, like yeah. the hanging, and just to be like, if I could only know. <laughs> you know I, I'd have to learn Chinese. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing. That, that's one of those things that even if you can see the video, it's still fucking hard to do, man. Yeah. It's a hard but just be like, do. how would anyone ever yeah. figure that out? <laughs> so hard and so delicious. But yeah, man, like, I, 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 I just wanted to learn how to make noodles. So if I was a better cook, I probably would have gone to France. Because mm. a chef would have said, hey, you're so good, I'm going to send you to my my mentor. But no chef I work for was ever going to do that to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Because I was a hot mess. I was just not good enough. So I just said, I'm going to focus on something where nobody's focusing on. Yep. And that was ramen. Weirdly enough, that was my thing. I would get, you know, books from japan i'd get go on craigslist being like can anyone translate these books and i'd put in the time and understand what exactly what's happening i would get magazines to know what was happening uh in ramen in japan at the time and i got a job working in japan um that's a whole nother i lived in a homeless shelter it was fucking wild because <laughs> that's, really? wow. that's the only place i could afford to live right but I learned so much there and I learned a lot about Japanese culture and how fucking insane it is and fucked up it is living with homeless people. Uh -huh. That's a whole nother podcast that I don't think anybody should want to listen to. <laughs> but, you know, that proved to be, because I wasn't good enough, I went somewhere else and I got some domain expertise that literally nobody had. It gave me an advantage. So, I come back. And at that time, did you define it in your head as noodles? Ramen. I just wanted ramen. So okay, ramen. But yeah. I wound up making soba. I, I Tom Clicky and Marco Canaro helped me got a job at the Park Hyatt Hotel where that Lost in Translation movie happened. Yep. Mm -hmm. So when I watched that, all those people Forgot in there about that movie, man. are yeah. real employees that I work with. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even the swimming instructor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. I was like, I knew all those people, um, and I learned so much. And when I learned what I learned at that hotel was instrumental because. 
uh, one of the restaurants, the New York Grill, they were serving food from uh, contemporary New York restaurants, but made with Japanese ingredients. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. So that flipped the switch for me a little bit. I was like, wait a second. Like, I don't know exactly how this is going to play out down the road, but it, I'm going to remember this because I, I thought you have to make everything as a facsimile. If you're going to make Italian food, it's got to be with Italian ingredients. Yep. But mm -hmm. That like shattered it for me. Anyway, I come back and uh, 2003, I come back to America. And at that time, this is like peak, like beginning of peak fine dining in America. Beautiful time in American dining in New York. You had Thomas well, Keller. What do you, you say the peak is? 2003? 2004 to 2015. So at a 10 year period, yep. it was like peak fancy fine dining. But that was the beginning of it. And you had many great restaurants opening up. Um, and I just was trying to get a job at Per Se. Uh, Thomas Keller coming back to New York uh, after uh, many years opening up the French Laundry. And a lot of my chef that I worked for was going to be the chef there. Anyway, in the meantime, the people that I used to work for said, you got to work for Andrew Carmelini at Cafe Blue. Because they're like, that's how it is. Like, you know, people trying to make sure that you develop into a great chef. And I get my ass kicked there. It's so fucking hard. <laughs> So fucking hard, but, but give people an idea that that haven't worked in this atmosphere. What does getting your ass kicked look like? <sighs> to this day, it's the hardest job I've ever had. Um, but like what? Like if you said I got my ass kicked working at the salt mine, so uh, I'd be like, oh, I can picture that. <laughs> it was it was intentionally run lean. So when I say ass kicking, it's not physically getting your ass kicked. It's the workload that's fucking kicking the ass. Um, it, it, but a workload of physical yeah th th most places today would probably have i would say that that kitchen you were each person was doing the workload of probably three people in this essence while there was a butcher um that was about the only help you would get a lot of the bigger kitchens you have a kumi maybe two kumis like an intern right mm -hmm. then what's the word you use kumi c-o-m-m-i-s of the french brigade system so an assistant then um you have a like you're running like the meat station. You might have a, uh, uh, entremetier. So someone doing your vegetables inside. So like you're the manager, it's almost like a bank, right? You're the managing director of your group, right? Mm -hmm. But all mm -hmm. these other people work for you and, and in, a, in a kitchen, it's all top down. So if you're working the saucier station, you're going to have all these other people in a big kitchen doing really high end dining cafe at the time, it was intentionally Spartan. Like there was nothing that worked equipment wise that was done on purpose, right? Um, it was as bare boned on as an operation staff wise intentional, right? Because it produced a certain mentality mm -hmm. of like, fuck everybody, fuck you, fuck this station and fuck everything, everything by our sheer mental, like prowess, our technique with everything working against us, we're going to fucking win. Okay. And it was that, that kind of hardcore. It was like, I don't, I never want to approach anything to like special forces, but that's sort of what it felt like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it was like that kind of fucking hardcore shit. I was like, Jesus this is so fucking hardcore. Um, and it's also dumb shit. I remember like, okay, like I got a bundle of uh sugar cane. You ever break down sugar cane? Yeah. Well, I mean, just <clears throat> as no, so I mean, like, not where there's any pressure on you. I, I've seen it done. Like, you know, like I've hussed rice too, but I mean, I hussed like a handful of rice <laughs> so one time. Like, <laughs> so like, so this menu, and it's awesome, man. And I, I love AC and Danielle. It's just like was a formative period for so many of us. And in that kitchen, you know, Rich Teresi, Mario Carbone opened up the, cor uh, like Teresi Carbone. So oh, many cooks came out of there. Come around to why are they, why are you breaking down sugar cane? <laughs> So like each station, you have four menus and a special menu. So cooking so stupid where the better you are, the more work you get too, right? Yeah. Which is crazy. <laughs> um, so in these four tasting menus, you have a voyage, you have a seasonal, um, you got a vegetarian, and then you got a classic, right? A classic French menu. And plus you have daily specials. You are responsible for like 10 to 12 dishes potentially with nobody helping you out. And you got to feed and you might be, you're working lunch service and dinner service on five of those days. So you need to prep out for maybe 250 people a day, potentially, you know, 10 courses for 250 people. That's a lot of work. 
yeah. and a lot of intricate work, yeah. knife skills and stuff like that. And everybody's that way. Everybody's got this crazy workload. Going back to the sugar canes, it was called sugar cane shrimp on the voyage menu. And I, it would come in, I would dread about it the next morning because I'm like, shit, we don't have a bandsaw. That would have made it easy. I have no tools whatsoever to break down sugar cane. You know what I have? I have two cleavers and a mallet. <laughs> Not only do I have to break down all the sugar cane, which you haven't seen, it's like, you know, eight feet tall and there's like a hundred of them. That's how they're getting it in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so fucking, it's just so stupid. Huh. And you're reducing that to like skewers? Yeah, you or? break it down and it's got to be a perfect toothpick yeah. that can skewer <laughs> a shrimp. And they're buying it like it, like it, some dude cut it out with a machete just, and then there it is. He, yeah. he eats like an hour's worth of work in one bite. And you're like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, man. So like shit like that, right? And and like that's just one dish. And everybody there had super labor intensive dishes. Is the money good in this no. at this level? No. I think I got paid eight dollars twenty five cents an hour. So you were hourly. Oh yeah. Hmm. And what's the promise? Nothing. No one gets into this business to make money. Uh, uh. You just want to be have street cred. You want to be the fucking baddest, best person there. Yeah. Anyway, and your social life's got to be baked into it too in a weird way. There's right? no social life. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's like just drinking heavily. Yeah, it's just <laughs> meaning that when you fall into the, I never, I never worked in the restaurant business, but when you fall into this world, um, that sort of becomes your. It's not that way anymore. Oh, it's not. Like, no way. That's who you hang with. That's who yeah. you date. Like that's thankfully, who... in, in in one regard, the work life balance is way better, and it's just the way it was back then. And it's not anymore. Um, but, man, we would work. Like the industry's a little friendlier. Oh, it's become way more professionalized. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't, there's no begrudging. That's just the way it was. And I'm happy that I was able to, like, experience that. Um, but, man, we would get off work at, like, I don't know, break everything down, 1 o'clock. We would get there maybe 6 o'clock, <laughs> 6.30. So sometimes, like, you go out just enough and then you'd go back, you drink and then you would sleep in the locker room and wake up and just do it again. Really? Yeah. That's not hyperbole. Like it was a lot back then because no one cared about it. It was like the least cool profession. There was nothing fabulous about cooking and it was a lifestyle that people chose. Mm -hmm. And I was not good in that kitchen either. I was very, I struggled. It was so hard for me. Well, like, what made you not good? Hmm. I wasn't as good as everyone there. It's good fast? Good as everything. Good is also mentally just being organized, never being in the weeds, not making any mistakes, uh -huh. being efficient with your time. You know, when I can see, when I, it's like a dance, right? And it, like literally a professional choreographed dance, um, a ballet almost. When a perfect kitchen is running, everyone's doing their thing. There's no talking. There's humor. A healthy kitchen, in my opinion, is always <laughs> someone making another person laugh. Right? Mm -hmm. Laughter is a huge part of it. But at the same time, it's like you're seeing a good team. It's efficiency. Nobody's moving in a way that you don't have to. It's efficiency of movement. It's dishes coming out perfect. Everything's tasted and great, all these things. And for me, I just, it wasn't, wasn't, my, my, wasn't my bag. And I had a lot of shit happening in my life too, right? So I was like, I got to fucking unplug. I can't do this. So in that interim, I go home, help out at home with my mom. I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm just going to, I'm just going to try to, you know, you know, September 11th happened too. Yeah. That was also a big thing. You were in uh, the city then. In oh New York. Yeah. yeah. That was like, I remember coming out, I was in the basement of craft. I mean, even though it was a year and a half. So after spending the 11th, like three months later, New York was still fucked up for like, 18 months, 24 months after it. But I remember, I'll never forget leaving like 17th Street, Union Square and seeing people covered in dust. Yeah. Mm. I was just like, what the fuck is happening? And so all these things, and again, I had all these things happen. Sure, it wasn't like, for me it was difficult and I just was like, I needed something else to do. So I was like, fuck it. I was extremely depressed and I was like, you know what? A lot of my friends at the time were going to business school I was like 25, 26. And I remember like, oh, they're getting loans out or they're getting, figuring out, oh, it's probably like 200 grand for two years. I was like, 
I'll figure that out on my own. I'm going to, even though I have no idea what I'm going to do, even though I've never even uh, achieved rank, I've been cooking professionally four and a half years, nobody would do anything like that. I also knew that if I continued in that path of what it was the traditional way, how people open restaurants was exactly this way, especially if you worked at a place like Danielle or Cafe Balut. A wealthy patron would come in many times, get to know the chef, and be like, hey, um, you know, I want to open up a restaurant in uh, uh, Palm Beach. Mm-hmm. You know anyone? And the chef would be like, yeah, I got a great cook. Here you go. Yep. That's how you get your own opportunity. And their motivation is, is in some respects, social. Exactly. Yep. And for a cook, that's how you got a restaurant. Hmm. That's how you became a chef. There was this, this is a j- different time and era, well, yeah. even though it wasn't that long ago. Huh. And I remember looking, again, I'm a very competitive person, like the field. I'd be like, I think I'm like number 14 here, honestly. I was like, because it's going to take 14 patrons. And even then, I don't think I'd be like <laughs> nominated, right? I was like, there's like 14 people ahead of me, talent-wise, on the ladder. So I was like, yeah. I got to just do something else. And that's when I was like, screw it, I'm going to open up a ramen bar, a noodle bar, which didn't exist. And I try to work, this is how, uh, where the state was uh, in noodles and ramen in America in 2003. I had to work at Bally's Casino in, New- in Landing, New Jersey to work at a noodle bar because there was not one oh. on the Eastern Seaboard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but was like, but was. You know, just to see what it's like. Yeah. But at that time, what year is this again? 2003. Was there, um was kind of like the ethnic explosion. No. So was it that, that, you know, the, the sort of cultural elevation of, you know, the, 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 the taco truck, the bon me joint. It was there. It just wasn't cool. Okay. So it was the it gatekeepers was, were still, it was there. Not as like, not like the cool kids were all going to, it wasn't to, cool yet. You know, food yeah. wasn't even cool. Yeah. The word mm-hmm. foodie didn't exist. Yeah. There was no cell phone. There was no oh, cell phone. There was no smartphone technology. Mm-hmm. And there was no chat rooms. No bloggers. Talk, no blogging. That all happened around 2003, 2004. So breaking out was hard. Yeah. Um, and it was all about being in the New York Times and traditional gatekeeping. Um, and while it was there, think about how hard it would be to learn in your city when there's no internet. Mm-hmm. You know, hard, it's, it was so hard. So, I mean, I come back and we open up. Nobody wanted to work with me. I had to hire, I got my first partner, Kino Banca, from Monster.com, who his girlfriend saw, because she was in a corporate <laughs> job. And he had just come from Austin, Texas. And he wasn't getting the love from working. He was trying, he came to New York because he wanted to get the street credit working at the best kitchens too, but they didn't give him any love. So he's like, screw it, like, I'll work with you. And that's how it all happened. And we almost went out of business. I raised $100,000. Um, and we were going out of business. So I, I felt like at that time, every day was like, it felt like we're not going to make it to the next day. Like you're going to burn through your investment. Not just day, like how I was living too. So hardcore and hard. But there's a, I can't remember who wrote this passage, but it's like, hey, like uh, everything we did was like a one-way ticket. Mm. Mm-hmm. And we ain't coming back. And yeah. that's how we made every decision. And by doing that, we made every decision you're not supposed to do. And some of those decisions were so counterintuitive that they became mainstream decisions today of how you would operate a restaurant. So a lot of it was trial and error, making mistakes, a lot of luck. We were so lucky and I won't bore you with all the different things that happened along the way. Um, but it was 600 square feet, the size of one car garage. And we, we went off, we, I remember um, three months in, I didn't even know what sales tax was. I knew nothing. I remember being like, oh, I got to pay taxes on this? What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's none of your business. <laughs> what I make? Yeah. How do I, you know, it's like so, so dumb and such a novice at anything that happened. But, uh-huh. you know, every day was a war, felt like a challenge. And I remember being told that we had about two weeks left of cash, right? And at the time, there was a lot of cancer in my family. And I was like, huh. I've seen it happen enough where someone has given some kind of like cancer diagnosis and then they start fucking like shit. Like I gotta like do things. I gotta like live. I'm going to do anything I can. So at that time I was thinking we were still trying to operate in the confines and the structure of a traditional restaurant. 
But when that diagnosis came in that we're going to fucking die, we're like, fuck it. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck it, man. Let's just go. Let's do whatever the fuck we're going to do. Happened to coincide with spring. So we stopped being whatever we thought an Asian noodle bar needed to be. And we just started to make good fucking food. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all happened. Caught lightning in a bottle. We're blessed to have some of the best and brightest working there. And it just happened, man. And um, it was a wild, it was a wild time. That's for sure. What was, was your first place, Momofuku? Noodle bar. Yeah. yeah. 163 First Avenue. Uh, 600 square feet upstairs. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> All in. I live next door. Um, and that was a lot. I mean, that was a long time ago, but there's just no way you could have predicted that it would have happened. Yeah. Wild, wild ride. At that time, you, you, you probably didn't do anything just for the fun of it. 10 years of my life, I felt, I honestly would tell myself, especially when I, I think an important thing that happened, I started getting like mental help too, but um, I would tell myself I work in a coal mine. That's how I viewed my job. Yeah, I'm working at a coal mine and that's my job. Living next door, you probably yeah. saw the sun. Like- Every day. And I did, <laughs> I never slept um, yeah. because our kitchen was so small and we're speaking, we, we started to get super busy I had to cook all the food at night. <laughs> so from like, I would go back, you know, I'd probably go to bed. I'd not go to bed. I was at the bars for sure, but I would uh, wake up and cook things at night in the, in the convection oven we had downstairs um, and get ready. And that happened. God, it's hard for me to rec- like recall all that happened. Cause it was fucking insane. I work like a crazy person. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. No, and I remember like nobody, I'm not going to fail because I did not work as hard as I possibly could. And I remember thinking, if I have to, de- I remember even before opening it up, if I have to declare bankruptcy, then so fuck, who cares? You know, like, you know it doesn't matter. It's a one-way ticket. Everything yeah. was like, let's go. Burn the ships. Everything and- was all in, <laughs> let's go. And you can do that for for only so long mm-hmm. before it catches up with you. Yeah. What do you think of like now when you hear people talk about uh, work life balance and and uh, you know this this emerging movement um, against perfectionism, right? I think there's a lot of I think about it a lot. Now I don't live that life, and I don't even cook professionally really anymore. I do mostly media. Um. I sort of needed the, and I don't mean this in a fucking terrible way, you know, uh, this sounds terrible, but all the things that happened in the pandemic. But for me, one of the positives was it helped me like really reset. Mm-hmm. Um, I have two kids, moved out to Los Angeles. We were going to do that anyway. But it ca- gave me a lot of time to reflect on um, that pursuit of perfection. And I think about a lot, I think about this a lot, particularly with sports. Um, I wonder if, the juice is worth the squeeze, hmm. right? We're so dedicated as a culture to, at least I was, to the pursuit of perfection, to being number one. And we celebrate that. All these self-help books and all these books about achieving greatness. Our society is about celebrating these few individuals, right, that do something extraordinary. But nobody ever talks about, like, you know, the proverbial metaphorical mountain peak no one ever talks about coming back down, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of times I felt like if you get to wherever you're trying to go, oftentimes for me it was you're going to celebrate by yourself because maybe nobody wants to celebrate with you, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And I found it to be an extremely lonely journey. And I think about that a lot, about work-life balance. Maybe I think we've definitely overcorrected, over-indexed the other way. But there's something to be said about a younger generation being like, no, I don't want that life. That sucks. I don't blame them. Why would you want to work like the way I did working, you know, on the Upper East Side 90 hours a week? Because the whole country will fall apart. Man. I know, but there's got to be a better balance. And for me, balance has always been what I, how I think about, and this is, again, this logical thing I learned in college, right? There, uh, this paradox, right? I believe balance is fully committed to two things simultaneously. It's not about finding an equilibrium 50-50. I think mm. you've got to be committed simultaneously yeah. to two mm. things and understand work-life balance. I'm a big believer in it. 
but like we have to also work our asses off at the same time right trying to find the split i don't know that's a great <laughs> point man about uh that's a great point about balance being that you're committed to two things all the way all the time I'm just look at a, a scale Think about the physics of a scale. Yeah, yeah. Is not that you're half one, half the other. <laughs> when I'm trying to sell myself to my wife, I'll point out to her, look, I'm trying to explain that she actually is has it, you know, it's not as bad as it she's might seem. She's lucky to have you. Yeah, she's lucky to have me. I'll point out, I'll be like, dude, you got to look at, you know, I'm very dedicated to work and imagine the opposite. I'm super dedicated to my family and imagine the opposite. That's got to be worth something. But book would tell you, you got to split that by 50%. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't do that. I think that is your balance. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've I'm like, just look at the bright side. <laughs> thought about that in a lot of different ways. That balance I see in food, right? I think perfectly. I'm a weird fucking dude, man. I, I think about things in weird fucking ways. Uh, perfectly salted dish is similar to a lot of things I've learned over the years, particularly from school, but. It's not a logical problem, but perfectly salted dish, if you think about it, if you put out 10 cups of water, each varying scales of salt. Mm -hmm. From none to too much. Somewhere in the middle. What is the middle? Is it going to be like 10 milligrams and 10 milligrams of salt and water? No, it's going to be what you think. When you taste something, you're like, that's I think not it's going to be enough. six, number right? six. Maybe it's not. <laughs> Maybe it's probably, but, but the actual moment in your head when you think of balance, it's not, ah, oh, this scratch that's itched. Oh, that's perfect balance. Yeah. It actually is this living thing in the sense of, I taste something salty, and this is what I try to teach cooks. So imagine telling this to a mm -hmm. cook there's like, who's 18 years old, like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> He's like, hungry He's on over. peyote. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're going to taste it and it's going to be, no, that's under seasoned. Yeah. And then you think about it and you're like, no, that's too salty. And then it oscillates back to, no, I think that's, I could use more salt. And then you think about it some more. It's like, no, that's too much salt. And when it, sea sauce, back and forth, back and forth, that's fucking proper salt. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You taste something. It's a simple test. And that yeah. moment is alive. As crazy as it sounds. Yeah, that's a great point, mm -hmm. man. And that's what you want. That's fucking balance. It is both simultaneous. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's good, man. <laughs> Philosophy I swear and I didn't religion. Take I know. Yeah, yeah. Or nothing, man. <laughs> no, that's great. Hey, well, there's one last thing I wanted to ask you about. And um, talking about balance is uh, part of what, you know, you part of what a little bit of our behind, little, this is a little behind the scenes here. Um, I like to interview and have on guests. I especially love to interview and have on guests who've, you know, excelled in their field or done something really cool. Um, but what makes them eligible is that they, the, the, the litmus test is they have to, um, participate in my mind. They have to participate in the fields, you know, the disciplines, hunting, fishing, um, or else this place would just be a shit show. <laughs> You know, there'd be no way to control who comes through the doors. So during those years of just hustle and driving yourself, you know, to the men mental edge, um, at, w at what point did you, when did you find fishing, like your grown up version of fishing? When did you find fishing and what did it, there what did a, it come to mean? There was a break. I mean, when I first started fly fishing, what I realized was I liked it because, you know, and I did jujitsu for a while. So I say it's not chess. It was like jujitsu with uh, nature, mm -hmm. right? Every situation's different. It's constantly changing. And no matter how expert you are, if you really are thinking about it, you're like, I don't know fucking shit. Like, this yeah. is impossible. But I'm also an addict and I'm an adrenaline junkie. And uh, you know, when I first understood and I caught my first trout and it was like that fucking big, but I did it on my own. There was no guide. It was like the best feeling in the world. And I was like, oh, I could do this. I like this. I didn't think it was something I was going to continue to do. And I actually, even when I'm into Japan, I got like a through eight rod. I was going to do it. I never got a chance to do that. And when I started cooking, it was like three or four years. So you I didn't, didn't fish in Japan? I had a rod ready to go. But huh. man, I never, never went. Because I was no, near, I was in the south, not near yeah. the north. Uh, even still, let's be honest, I probably would have gone anyway. 
And it took some time for me to get back to, uh, at the time I was doing a lot more winter sports too, but once I started to get back out to the Rockies to fish, that's what I worked towards. Those are like my one, like 10 days of like, I gotta fucking get there. Mm -hmm. If I don't do this, I don't know what the fuck's gonna happen. I gotta get there. I don't even know how I'm gonna, how am I gonna get there? Well, you know, I can afford it, but I gotta do it. And that just became something I continued to do. On an um, annual basis. Yeah, sometimes biannual basis. Yeah. And uh, at some point, like Mike Dawes, who's at West Bank Anglers now in Jackson, you know, I would continue to go and made some more money and I would, you know, have more trips and and such. And then I got my brother into it. And then I just sort of made the, not that I, listen, I am not someone that ties their own flies. I don't actually don't have the dexterity to do it. And there's so much more for me to learn on trout fishing. But I got to New Zealand mm -hmm. and I was like, what the fuck is this? South Island. That's the, have you been? Yep. It's the best, man. Well, I was shit talking New Zealand earlier today. <laughs> well, they you don't know, have something I said just earlier today, I was telling someone, I said, when I'm on a plane that long <laughs> and I got off the plane, I want shit to be way different. <laughs> it wasn't different <laughs> enough. And I'm like, man, these guys are, this is a lot like I'm home. But not for trout fishing, though. Yeah, it's the same damn it's fish. It's not the same thing. It's not. Listen, it's like, it's like, you mean to tell me that I came this far and there's still rainbows and brown trout? Yes, but it's not the same. There's no Like birds I said, I want to see people with bones in their hair, man. <laughs> I want to see like, you know. Dude, for me, it's totally different. I disagree, man. I think for me, it was totally different. Different, different everything. And they don't follow any of the same patterns of fish. And I was like, whoa. And it's sight casting. It's yeah. the first time I did sight casting for real. You can sight cast at a Spring Creek, but like fishing to a, like a eight pound brown trout that's in like six inches of water in the middle, and you just had to walk a shit ton to get there. Yeah, one mm -hmm. well, there's one brown trout per kilometer. Yeah, now you're making it seem cool. Yeah, because yeah, it is fucking cool. <laughs> Listen, I I liked it. I had a great time. Did a stuff there. I'm sure I'll go again. But like I said, I just felt like when I got off the plane, I was a little bit dismayed that they all because you, you that they too spoke much my angle. That they spoke my language. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, is this talking English? I, I, Come on, I, dude. So that was when I was Let's like, oh, crazy shit. Man. shit. <laughs> you can you can you can hunt for fish. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I was yeah. like, okay, Dawes got me on to saltwater fishing and did bone fish. And there's great bone fishing in Andros and Seychelles and other places, but you know within. 10 hours, that's like my wheelhouse for travel. I was like, all right, like we're going to, I need something more. And that became like permit fishing. And listen, I think I'm like a permit good, specifically. Yeah. I got permit fever, man. And I think I am, I think I'm a good angler. I will never think I'm, I, when I, I mean, I just went, I caught more permit than anyone on the trip and everyone was a good angler. Um, but I'm not like the pros, man. I'm not even, I suck compared to the best, man. So I think I'm pretty average mm -hmm. at it. And it's not I even you, I, I like I've it. never, so, I told you, I never caught, I've never caught a permit. I hate, I hate it though. I don't love it because it's so fucking frustrating. Mm -hmm. It, it drives me insane because it's so goddamn hard. And that's why I love it, man. I'm after that pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would tell you a funny permit story that happened to me recently. We were spearfishing in the Bahamas and we were in probably 40 feet of water at the surface. And here comes a permit. And he goes into a cave. And I was like, and I was saying to the guy, I was with Cameron Kirk Connell. We're talking about it. You know, he stuck our heads up out of the water. And I'm like, holy shit. He goes, no, man, that's normal permit shit. For that permit to be on a flat is weird for right. him. <laughs> this right. is what he's normally doing. He goes, your idea that he like is on the flats. He's like on the flats for a minute now yeah. and then. <laughs> they, want, they want the deeper water. Not... <laughs> yeah. He's like, that's like what they do. You, your experience with them up there is like not his normal plan. You know, he'll check that shit out now and then. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny, man. I, I, when I started to do that and I remember showing people, um, the reason I got into some like just shooting some guns at, at <laughs> animals and stuff because I was with somebody from New York and I showed him a photo of a permit. They're like, you didn't catch a fucking permit. This very successful person. And I was like, no, I did. And he's like, bullshit. Where's the photo? Photo doesn't count. And I, was, and I got like 30 of them. <laughs> he's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and he took me on all these fucking fun trips. So oh, really? Gonna, the huh. permit fishing has opened my doors to a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, the one permit I've been on a boat 
to see landed was even disappointing. So my brother Danny, we're in Belize. Huge school of permit come by. He hooks one. We're jumping up and down, hooting and hollering, high five, and he gets it in. It's foul hooked in the fin, man. So it didn't even like <laughs> doesn't count, yeah, man. No, doesn't no it count. didn't count. It was the most deflating. Like, yeah, we were so excited that it would be like, oh, just <laughs> it's like it wasn't even the one you were at. You know, it was like his neighbor got snagged in the fin. But it doesn't seem like you love fly fishing, though. It doesn't seem like that. Does he like fly fishing? I fly I fish him, a lot. I don't hear summer. him talk <laughs> much about fly fishing. <laughs> I fish a, I fly fish a lot this summer because we my I camp with my kids. Um, we spend a lot of time in the summer on a drainage where you're not allowed to kill cuts, and the the fish the 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 the, the trout the the primary trout that I'm interested in is cutthroats. I wouldn't cross the street to catch a rainbow. I like cutthroats. They're fun to catch, though. I like cutthroats. Love cutthroats. And you can't kill cuts where we like to fish cuts. So I don't want to hurt them. So we just fish them with uh, barbless dries, and we like to sneak up on them. Find them. It's like you don't catching one you don't know about doesn't count. We like to identify (laughs) them, observe them name him how clear is this water you're fishing very clear (laughs) all right (laughs) and we like to learn like at what cadence does he sort of drop back in his hole oh because you're in montana and go forward and then we catch him and then it's it becomes deeply personal and then you let him go and there's some fish that i even told my boy i i banish him from catching that fish anymore (laughs) like that fish leave that one alone we're gonna harass you know don't catch him the rest of summer (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and um and i find a great amount of pleasure in that man a pleasure i never knew i would find man i was trying to find my first permit for you but i, I... want to see one so you got, that's a real permit yeah. yeah yeah but i got a bunch and i don't know where the fuck i put them all anyway that's great um yeah I, I never thought that that would be my thing a permit but, um, fisherman. <laughs> it's the wildest thing. A ra- ramen man. Yeah. Permit anger. And like I was, here's the thing. Like I go, I go, I'm lucky enough to go trout fishing a bunch this summer. Probably like 14 days on the river. Um, <laughs> I go trout fishing to practice my uh, <laughs> saltwater fishing. Right, permit fishing. <laughs> You're like, what or if the baby, ocean moved really fast? Yeah. Yeah. Or baby tarpon. Like, love yeah. catching baby tarpon. All right? Because that's basically streamer fishing almost, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's the kind of asshole I am. They're like this fucking guy. <laughs> you know, what is he doing? He doesn't even care about catching the trout. So so what, Uh, because uh, you're an ingredients person, you're a food person. Um, How often do you catch fish and eat it? In... Salt water, it's snook, yep. snapper, yep. sometimes barracuda, but yeah. less so because of all the secretary yeah. risk. Yeah. Um snook is awesome. Okay. Um probably one of my favorite eating fish. S- the the snappers you catch down there when you're catching yeah. I mean, in the mangrove, I caught a huge fucking snapper this summer. And um, I have a photo of it. I, I don't even know where it is, but you'll cook one up. Oh uh, yeah, we grilled, we we split it open, butterflied it, um, cooked it over fire, and it was awesome. And ate yeah. it with some tortillas. It was sublime, you know. That's great. And snook, I mean, most people don't. It's sort of like a striped bass, but that's a amazing eating fish. Um, yeah, that's the only time. Permit. I want to eat a permit, but that's the livelihood of all those guys down there. So yeah. I can't. <laughs> No, and want you so places bad. they'll hang you for eating permit. Yeah. You'd, better, you'd be better off eating a person. I really do look for on the water floating permit that a dolphin is eating because they only eat the head. No, oh. yeah, a lot of times. So I'm always like hoping that. What I'd a be- find! Yeah, yeah, let me know if you find one. <laughs> <laughs> you like guilt free permit yeah. consumption. So that's because I've heard. This is like talking about like we we're just talking about a recipe on a menu. Like I've only heard what a permit tastes like. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's like. Cause it eats crab and shrimp and clearly I could go eat a fucking pompano or something. Sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thing, but like something down there or something I dream about. Well, someday sure. when you send me a photo, send me a photo of a headless permit and I'll know, what, I'll, know <laughs> yeah. I'll know that it happened. For All right. Sure. Well, David Chang, man, thank you for joining. Um, next time you're into your grocery store, I'm talking to you listeners.
keep your eye out uh, if you're heading out backpack and keep your eye out for uh um momofuku ramen if you want to have the uh, uh lightweight meal air, air and if you want to go for the real deal find the restaurants well we got uh you can go to shop.momofuku.com and uh i'll try to get you guys a discount code i, I don't know <sighs> Great. Yeah, for sure. We'll give you a discount. And then, and then get, tell people tell how people to find how how best to find you and how to find your restaurants. And um, you can visit us at uh, momofuku.com and all the media stuff we're doing uh, at majordomomedia.com and my uh, social media is at at David Chang. All right. Yeah. Thanks for joining, man. Really appreciate the time. Honor, guys. This was fun. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Hey everyone, this is still Steve, but I'm not with Dave. Dave Chang, the, the guest you just listened to, followed up after the show with a kind gift for y'alls. Right now, you can get anything you want from Momofuku at 20% off by using the code MEAT20 at Momofuku.com. MEAT20, 20% off. Get yourself a big old pocket full of uh, ramen noodles. Momofuku.com, meet 20 for 20% off.